Self-defense. When we are falsely accused, it is not wrong to defend ourselves, but when we do, we should always reflect the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Here's Jean. At this point in this letter, 2 Corinthians, we have a sudden shift as far as Paul's subject is concerned. And he picks up with something that he's dealt with really from the beginning of the letter, but he's done it subtly. He's, he's addressing the false accusations of the false apostles. Now, just to review, back in chapter 1, he was accused of being double-minded and self-serving. Remember? Because he didn't come to Corinth the second, that second time, he went on to Troas and he wrote a letter instead. They said, these false apostles, you see? He says yes, and he says no. You don't know what he means. He's double-minded. And Paul subtly and sensitively addressed that. A little later, chapter 3, the false apostles were saying, Paul doesn't have any verification. He has no letters of verification. Nobody's approving him as an apostle. And that, of course, related to the Jews and their verification from the Sanhedrin. And Paul said, Corinthians, you are my letter of verification. Again, you see, he was addressing it. Then in chapter 4, they accused him of giving up. In other words, he left Ephesus and just gave up because of persecution. He didn't come back here because he didn't want to face us. He gave up, and Paul addressed that and said, I didn't give up. That was not in the plan. That was not my motive. He addressed that. In chapters 4 and 5, they said, he's not teaching circumcision as God designed in the Old Testament. And Paul said, I'm interested in circumcision of the heart. And that's what God is interested in. So all along, you see, he is addressing this. He's building up to a stronger statement because the accusations got stronger. So you see this building uh, throughout the letter. Now, you see, when Titus met him in Macedonia, he reported probably in all of this, all of the accusations. But Paul, as he began to write the letter, addressed them point by point, but he's building his case in terms of intense, severe attacks. And notice he addresses one of those severe attacks right here in chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. I don't want to seem as though I am trying to terrify you with my letters. In other words, these false apostles were saying, see, he's terrifying you. He said, Paul said, no. For it is said, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his physical presence is weak and his public speaking amounts to nothing. Whoa. You talk about an offensive accusation against the Apostle Paul. And he's going to be addressing that now in a very direct way. And Paul goes on to say, let such a person consider this, who's accused me this way. What we are in our letters, when we are absent, we will also be in our actions when we are present. Now, he's laying the groundwork for something he's going to say later that is very, very strong and helps us to understand some very significant things about the Apostle Paul. With that in mind, um, let's think applicationally. You see, he's referring here to the fact that he is an apostle. And as an apostle, he has a unique calling. And one of the things we need to recognize in interpreting Scripture is that we do not have apostolic authority like Paul. He had apostolic authority. And he refers to this in chapter 12, verse 12. 
the signs of an apostle were performed with unfailing endurance among you, including signs and wonders and miracles. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2, we read about the fact that Jesus came performing signs and wonders and miracles in order to illustrate and show that He was God in human flesh. And the apostles were given these gifts once Jesus went back to heaven in order to convince people that Jesus was who He said He is, God in human flesh. And Paul was called to minister in a particular way to the Gentiles. And he was called as an apostle, and he was unique. So we need to understand that this is a unique calling. And Paul is going to utilize that unique calling in his communication with the Corinthians in terms of discipline. And we'll see that unfold. Notice in Acts 13, 9 to 11, but Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, this was on the first missionary journey, stared straight at Elymas and said, and this was a false prophet, notice what he said, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, that you son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? First of all, God gave him unusual insight into this man's motives, supernaturally. And he went on to say, now look, the Lord's hand is against you. Not my hand. The Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. That's apostolic power. That's the kind of same power that God gave to Peter and James and John and to the other apostles. And I've never met an individual on this earth who has those same powers. They may claim to, but they don't. They're not apostles. We're in that category. So we have to be very careful how we handle something like this. And by that, I'm simply saying there are some who will say, if you don't do what I say, I'm an apostle and so forth, and threaten people. Again, that's manipulation, and that's control, or it's self-deception. So we have to be very, very careful of that. Another point that I think that grows out of the whole biblical story is that, number two, we should allow others to speak for us and substantiate that we are being falsely accused. In other words, rather than trying to defend ourselves ourselves, which is not wrong, we should allow others to defend us. In fact, Paul did that himself. That was his preference. We're going to see, that was his preference. Not to utilize the power to bring discipline in their lives, his preference, or to defend him. And his preference was when he wrote this about Timothy. This is why I have sent Timothy to you. He is my dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus. Who will remind you? Timothy. He's traveled with me. He knows me. He can verify my calling. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everywhere in every church. And so that's an important application, I think, for us. And number three, we should always defend ourselves with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That was Paul's goal always, even when he had to be stern. Because remember, Jesus at times, once in a while, it seems, became stern. Remember the story of overturning the tables and the temple because of people were utilizing to do business and make money and to cheat people and took a rope and scattered things and overturned the tables. That was unusual. And what Paul is saying I don't want to use that power, but I will, but for one purpose, to protect you and to help you not to be deceived. And we're going to see that comes out as we read on. Now there were times where Paul had to deal with it very openly, 
and sternly, not his preference, but I'll tell you when he did it, and that was when people were being destroyed and hurt by false teachers. His whole motive was protection. And you'll read this, for example, in Crete, where Paul left Titus, and he wrote to Titus, and he says, For there are many rebellious people, full of empty talk and deception. And that basically describes these false prophets and false apostles in Corinth. They were in Crete as well. Especially, he says, those from the circumcision party, that is, those who are Jewish, like he once was, in terms of his unsaved state, and he said, they're leading people astray. In fact, he says, it is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. And he says, that is exactly, by implication, is what's happening in Corinth. And they're accusing Paul of their own sins. But the point being is that the reason Paul got to the place where he would use the power of God to discipline was to protect people from those who were destroying them. That was his motivation. And you're going to see that because he'll say that right at the end of the letter. The question for application, more specifically, is when being falsely accused, when may it be appropriate simply to allow the Lord to defend us? <laughs> that takes a lot of wisdom. And it also takes a lot of insight into our motivation. And I remember one situation where I knew about an individual, and I knew how he's manipulating. I knew that he was in a ministry, and I knew from facts what he was doing and his deception. And I knew it because he did it to me. And I didn't understand it until after the fact. But then I understood this man's motivations, in this other ministry as well. I decided to write a letter to those in authority in that organization and point out the evil in this man. But before I did, I ran it by two very special people that I trusted. And they said, Gene, don't send it, because it will be misinterpreted. They will think that you're trying to get even, because this man did a lot of evil to you and to those you love. And I remember saying, okay, <laughs> I don't agree with you in my feelings, but I agree with you in your wisdom. I remember going down Central Expressway saying, Lord, when are you going to get him? <laughs> I'm a bit angry today. Forgive me for expressing my feelings, and I know you'll take care of it in your time. For me, I needed to be silent. Guess what? God did deal with it. And when He dealt with it, He really dealt with it right. And I was protected in the process. Now that takes wisdom. But the wisdom, I think, comes not only from God, but from other people that you trust and helping you to discern what is right and what is wrong. So here's the principle to live by. When being falsely accused, it is not wrong to defend ourselves. But when we do, we should always reflect the fruit of the Holy Spirit.